another conversation with Professor Jonathan Kaufman. January of 2022 will be three years since we started KI Reads. Our first book was A Pigeon and a Boy by Meyer Shalev, um, and that first session was led by congregant Bob Nissenbaum, and we've been going strong monthly ever since. And we're a community of readers and learners, and we've become a community of good friends over the past three years. We usually start each meeting with a quick go round check in. We'll spare that tonight, but obviously hope everybody's been doing well. Um, I want to thank Sarah Skolnick, um, who suggested Last Kings of Shanghai for us to read, and to Chuck Morse. Um, who leaving Rosh Hashanah said, Shari, should we try and get Professor Kaufman? He's at Northeastern. I said, Chuck, that sounds wonderful. Will you please do it? And Chuck did. So great. Um, Professor Kaufman is a Pulitzer Prize winning reporter, editor, and author. Um, he is joined Northeastern as a professor and the director of the School of Journalism. Prior to that, he held senior positions at Bloomberg News, the Wall Street Journal, and the Boston Globe. Um, our rabbi, Bill Hamilton, not to be confused with your British book agent, <laughs> Bill Hamilton, who you thanked in your acknowledgments, reminded me actually that Professor Kaufman, we're welcoming you back to KI, that you were here in 1997 discussing your previous book, A Hole in the Heart of the World. So we welcome you back. Um, Professor Kaufman will speak and then we'll have a Q&A. People at home, online, around the country, I hear. Um, please chat in any questions you have. Um, after Professor Kaufman's done speaking, Chuck Morse will moderate the Q&A. Chuck, his wife Barbara, daughter Hannah, our longtime KI members, Chuck is a former radio talk show host and also an author of many books, including The Nazi Connection to Islamic Terrorism. Chuck presently hosts a podcast and is majoring in sociology at Bunker Hill Community College, a lifelong learner. Okay, so thank you everybody. And I'm going to turn it over to Professor Kaufman to discuss The Last Kings of Shanghai. Oh, thank you very much. It's really great to be here on what I know is sort of your first sort of non-religious event uh, since COVID. And I'm hoping <clears throat> this is the start for all of us of a return to normalcy. Um, I've always loved KI. We live in Newton, um, but we've had all sorts of ties to Brookline uh, over the years. In the old synagogue, we were at several bat mitzvahs, and now we have a new connection because our son, Ben Kaufman, uh, is the newly elected town clerk of Brookline. And um, he's with us tonight. So if you have any uh, town clerk type issues, please speak to him uh, after you're done with the questions about Shanghai. Um, so I, I wanted to start out by talking a little bit about um, how I got interested in this topic, because the idea of Jews in China or Shanghai doesn't seem like a, a natural fit. Um, and my interest in this really began uh, many years ago in the late uh, 1970s when I first visited China. Now, this was back in the time when China was still Red China. Uh, Mao had only been dead a few years. Um, everybody on the street was wearing those blue Mao suits that we remember. There were far more bicycles than cars. And um, I was a young foreign correspondent, and I was walking along the Bun, that sort of street in Shanghai with the beautiful Art Deco buildings. And um, I had to use the bathroom. And so I stepped into a, a hotel that was right there on the bun. And it felt like I had stepped into a 1930s movie set. The floors were marble. There were these beautiful chandeliers. Um, and a, a, a bellhop came up to me all dressed in white with a little white cap. And when I asked him in English where the bathroom was, he responded to me in French. And so I, I kind of left there puzzling, like what was this kind of beautiful Art Deco um, hotel doing in the middle of communist China? And then someone told me that it actually had been built by um, a Jewish um, financier, a Jewish playboy also, Victor Sassoon, uh, who at one point had been the richest man in Shanghai 
in the 1920s and 1930s, and it built this grand hotel. So the way reporters do, I kind of filed that away, went on with my other stories. Um, but then a few years later, I was back and um, I was assigned a minder. What the Chinese were doing back then was that they would, whenever a foreign correspondent would show up, they would assign sort of a someone uh, to kind of be with you all the time to make sure you <clears throat> only covered what they wanted you to cover. And you spent a certain amount of time trying to evade them. But in this case, he said to me that he wanted to show me the children's palace, which was a place in Shanghai where um, people would bring their, Chinese would bring their kids on weekends for ballet lessons, violin lessons, things like that. So I said, sure, it sounded like a nice feature story to do. And so he took me to this place, which I'm not sure what I was expecting, but it essentially was this huge mansion in the middle of Shanghai. It, it looked like it belonged more in Downton Abbey than it did in China. Uh, there were 43 rooms, um, beautiful sweeping staircases inside. And there were Chinese kids, you know, performing their music lessons. But this clearly had once been lived in by a, a very wealthy family um, and a, a British family, it seemed to me. And so as we left, I noticed there was a small plaque on the wall that said this had once been the home of the Kaduri family. The Kaduri family was another Jewish family I had heard about. I was based in Hong Kong at the time, and the Kaduris were the wealthiest Western family in Hong Kong. They were incredibly influential and powerful, um, but I didn't know that they had this history in Shanghai um, where they had lived um, all throughout the 1920s and 1930s. So a number of years later, I ended up being sent uh, to China for the Wall Street Journal to be the uh, Wall Street Journal's China bureau chief. And this time I brought my family, um, my wife, Barbara, and our three kids, um, including, including Ben. And um, we all loved Shanghai. We were based in Beijing, but Shanghai was so much fun to explore. We always enjoyed going there. And so one weekend we went out exploring into kind of a poor part of Shanghai uh, known as Han Kyu. And as we were walking along, I noticed that uh, along the doorposts of many of the tenement buildings there were the shadows of mezuzahs, not the mezuzahs themselves, but the shadows of them um, where, you know, they had, once, um, they had once been nailed to the wall. And again, I couldn't quite make sense of this. What were mezuzahs doing in Shanghai? But it turned out, of course, that these were left by the 18,000 Jewish refugees um, who had found safety in Shanghai during World War II. And while this was now a Chinese neighborhood, there was still this kind of ghost remembrance of, of the Jews um, who had lived there. So, you know, as a journalist, I thought, I got to find out more of what's going on. I need to know more of what, of what the backstory is here. And the story, as I discovered, uh, started in Baghdad, um, uh, in what is now Iraq. I think most of us know Jewish history, and we know the Fiddler on the Roof story. That's the story that's most relevant to most American Jews, um, of Jews who, you know, started out in, in, in the shtetl or in ghettos in Europe, um, worked their way up, came to America, and have achieved uh, great success and, and great prominence. Um, but this was a different story. Um, this is a story that actually started in the Bible. Um, we first read about the Jews of Baghdad in the Bible because Baghdad was Babylon. And when we read the Psalms that say, by the rivers of Babylon, we wept when we remembered Zion, um, these were the Jews of Baghdad. Um, they were kidnapped after the destruction of the temple, taken to Babylon, Baghdad, um, and stayed there. Um, but while they may have been weeping by the rivers of Babylon, um, they actually did incredibly well. Um, the, the Jews of Baghdad were very successful in trade and business. They, were, they set up academies of learning. Um, they created the first uh, the Babylonian Talmud. Um, they were one of the really most successful diaspora communities. So successful, in fact, um, that they really were considered almost part of the government of Babylon. Um, whenever the rulers of Babylon, the Turks, the Ottomans, others, um, needed advice on economics, on trade, they would often turn to the Jewish community. And they became so reliant on the Jewish community that they named one family um, and the leader of that family to be their intermediary, almost like the secretary of the treasury. Um, and this family head 
when he was taken to meet with the Pasha or the king, whoever was in charge at the time, would be carried through the streets of Baghdad on a sedan chair. And everyone, Jew, Gentile, Muslim, would bow their head in respect as this prominent Jew was taken to the palace. Um, this family was the Sassoon family, one of the two families that I write about. And um, they were one of the wealthiest families in Baghdad and had this uh, very powerful position as both the leaders of the Jewish community and advisors um, to, the, uh, to the king. Um, but as often happens in Jewish history, um, round about the 1820 or so, politics turned against the Jews of Baghdad. And um, rich Jews began being kidnapped by the government and held for ransom. And so my story begins with David Sassoon, who was 37 years old, about to take over this you know, very wealthy family um, and this very senior position. And um, he was kidnapped and put into prison. Um, and uh, his father quickly rushed down to ransom him out. But his father knew that, that things were not gonna go well for the Jews. And so he um, hustled David down to the waterfront and put him on a, a small ship that was gonna be sailing away from Baghdad. And um, before he stepped into the ship, um, David Sassoon's father draped a cloak around his shoulders. And inside that cloak, he had sewn rubies and pearls and other precious gems uh, to help his son get a start in his, in his new life away from Baghdad. So David Sassoon, who was supposed to spend, who was supposed to take over this wealthy dynasty, ended up spending his first night outside of Baghdad in the floor of a warehouse where the ship had dropped him off, uh, carrying a gun and shooting it at rats that were, that were skittering by. And so in many ways, I think the story I'm about to tell you, I think of not as much as Fiddler on the Roof, but almost a Shakespearean tragedy of a, a, a nearly royal family um, that is dispossessed, is, is, is everything is taken away from them. And they spend the rest of their lives um, and throughout the generations trying to get back and trying to get back to the influence and wealth um, that they had had in Baghdad. And China becomes the vehicle for that. So David Sassoon um, made his way eventually to India. And he arrived in India just as the British were arriving and um, turning India into a colony. And the British, while they were expanding around the world, um, it turned out really needed uh, Jews and other immigrants to help push their economic agenda. Um, they, they couldn't do it all on their own. And so whatever their social feelings about Jews or their snobbery, they recognized that Jews and others could kind of carry the Union Jack to other uh, countries and, um, and make money through trade and, and so forth. So David Sassoon quickly became uh, a very influential businessman in India and was so enamored of the British that he actually um, became a British citizen. He made all eight of his sons study English and, and British history. And even though he himself never learned English, when Queen Victoria ascended the throne, he made all his sons, who he had gotten out of Baghdad at that point, stand with him at the waterfront and sing God Save the Queen um, to signal his loyalty to the British Empire. Um, at this point, the British also decide they want to expand into China. And their motive is not territorial conquest. They want to go for trade. Um, the opium trade was incredibly lucrative. Um, but it was illegal in China. China did not want opium. Um, they saw how destructive it was. Just to give you an idea, in 1830s, 1840s, about 12% of China's population was addicted to opium. As a point of comparison, uh, about four to 5% of Americans are addicted to opioids, the opioid crisis that we've all read about. And we see the kind of pain and and problems that the opioid crisis um, has created here. Well, imagine twice that many, um, and you get a sense of the kind of crisis that China was facing. Um, but for the British firms that were involved in the opium trade, opium was incredibly lucrative. It was grown in India, smuggled into China, and you know every, every shipment uh, produced hundreds of thousands of dollars in profit. Um, and so David Sassoon began to dabble in the opium trade. And I'll have more to 
to say a little bit later about the morality of that. But um, he had become very successful and quickly had become a millionaire. Um, and when the British went to war with China, they went to war to open up uh, Shanghai uh, and other cities uh, to the opium and other kinds of trade. And David Sassoon is a good businessman, looked to China and thought, this is the future. This is where my family can begin to rebuild its wealth. So um, when China was formally opened up, um, Shanghai, Hong Kong, all these cities were suddenly um, available for trade. And David Sassoon really brilliantly uh, positioned his family to take advantage of the opium trade with a number of kind of remarkable innovations. I sometimes think of China as the Silicon Valley of its day, where young entrepreneurs would sort of go knowing there was tremendous wealth um, to be had. So uh, what David Sassoon did was um, he started buying steamships because steamships could make the trip from India where the opium was grown to Shanghai and Hong Kong where it was distributed much faster than sailing ships. And so David Sassoon was able to buy opium, load it on these ships, and get it very quickly um, to, um, uh, to China ahead of his rivals. He also invested in a new technology, the telegraph, um, which allowed uh, members of the Sassoon family to communicate with each other, Shanghai to Hong Kong, Hong Kong to Bombay, and, and develop their trade. Um, but the most valuable asset he had were his sons. David Sassoon had eight sons, and he essentially distributed them across China um, as uh, his intelligence network, his business partners. And it was those eight sons which really began to um, grow the business. And they were so successful that within 20 years, they had driven out uh, all their British rivals and taken over the opium, uh, the opium industry, essentially. Um, I was able to sort of see some of the records of the communists when they conquered Shanghai in 1949, seized the Sassoon business records. And I was able to go through them, and uh, the Chinese concluded, and I think they're right, that the Sassoons were able to make a billion dollars, that's B for billion, through the opium trade. And that became the foundation um, for expanding their fortune even more when they began to build factories and, and, uh, and do other things. Um, you know, it's a great business story, but obviously it also raises moral questions, because I think, especially as Jews, we like to think that somehow, you know, Jews in business apply a certain morality or, 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 or think about these things differently. Um, and when I've talked to the Sassoons today, the, the current living descendants, you know, they point out that opium was legal. Right, Opium was legal, it was grown in India, it was taxed by the British government. Um, and in fact, um, it was used often in Europe because aspirin wasn't widely available, so it was used as a painkiller. And frankly, one of the ways the Sassoons increased their influence by, was by allowing the Prince of Wales, later the King of England, to buy stock in opium and to kind of trade it and sort of make quick profits. So everyone knew about the opium trade. It was legal and everybody was, was involved in it. And the Sassoons would argue that, well, it was like cigarettes or alcohol. It was a vice and it's not something maybe to you know, be proud of, but it, it was, they were fulfilling a need. But the truth is, the more I kind of went through the documents and, and looked at what the Sassoons were saying at the time, you know, the Sassoons knew how dangerous opium was. Um, in fact, many of their own Chinese employees um, were becoming debilitated by the use of opium. The Sassoons themselves never used opium, um, but they fought uh, fiercely um, against any effort to restrict the opium trade. And so I, I think, you know, I've come to the conclusion that, um, that, that there was sort of you know, a way in which the Sassoons, um, while they were Jews and they were outsiders, also were very much British imperialists and colonialists, and like many of their British rivals, felt that opium was a, a lucrative way to, um, to make a fortune, and they weren't unique in that. I think it's Balzac has said famously, behind every great fortune lies a great crime, and for the Sassoons, that crime, that crime was, was opium. Um, 
I want to talk a little bit at this point about um, the women in these families, because the, the women are often, especially when you look at the 18th or 19th century, the stories of women are not really very well told. And, and there were some remarkable women um, that I discovered uh, in, in my research for this book. Um, as I mentioned, David Sassoon had eight sons. And um, after they had kind of conquered China and established their business there, David Sassoon recognized that London was the future, that if you wanted to be a true global dynasty, you had to establish um, you know, beachheads in London. So he began to send his sons to London with instructions to buy country houses, enroll your children in Eton uh, and Cambridge University, and to start throwing these elaborate parties where they would invite all sorts of um, uh, British aristocracy, including the Prince of Wales. They, in fact, began to fund the Prince of Wales's gambling habit. They would travel with him on rest cures. Uh, the Sassoons became quite prominent in British society. Um, but they were always looked at as Jews. And it's interesting, when I was able to look at the Sassoons would write back and forth to each other almost every day by telegraph or, or by letter. And the, the, the sons in Britain would write to their dad or to their older brother who was in India. You know, we had this great party and the Prince of Wales came and we danced until 3 a.m. And, you know, the British aristocracy really embraced us. And then when I would read what the British were writing in their diaries and their private letters, they would say, who are these hook-nosed Jews? Um, what do they think they're doing? We'll, we'll eat their food, but we really don't want to socialize with them. And in fact, Winston Churchill, who became friends with the Sassoons, um, when the Prince of Wales became King Edward, um, wrote to a friend and said, I wonder if he's going to take his Jews with him to Buckingham Palace. So there was this, this kind of this, this double life that was going on where the Sassoons were accepted for their money and their influence, but socially were always considered outsiders. Um, but while the Sassoons were partying and, and living it up in London, nobody was really paying attention to the business back in China and in India. And the last remaining Sassoon brother uh, in India who was running the business end of the family died unexpectedly. And this was a crisis for the family, you know, what, what would they do? And so at that point, his wife, a woman named Flora Sassoon, stepped forward and said that she would agree to run the business from India until their teenage son became of age and could take things over. And the, her brothers-in-law in London thought that was fine. I mean, she was just a woman and, you know, what could she do? And she'd sort of be a caretaker um, until, until uh, their son uh, came of age. Um, it turned out that uh, Flora Sassoon was an extraordinary woman. Um, she had a very good business sense. She spoke several languages. Um, and this was at a time when not only women couldn't vote, women in India couldn't even be seen in public. They lived behind what was called herda, which meant they were not allowed to be seen outside. Um, so Flora Sassoon began um, uh, running this business empire from her living room. But gradually, she began to kind of break the rules, began to visit the Sassoon offices, and to travel around. Um, and she was extraordinarily successful. And in a situation much like what we're living through now with a pandemic, a bubonic plague pandemic struck Bombay. And many of the workers of the Sassoons, you know, for this huge workforce that was running their factories and with opium, they refused to go to work because they were terrified of getting infected. So Flora Sassoon reached out and brought over scientists from Europe to try to find a cure um, for the bubonic plague, a vaccine, which they did. And then in kind of an extraordinary moment, she insisted on having uh, taking the vaccine herself, rolling up her sleeve, getting the shot, and having a photograph made that would be shown to all the workers to show that the vaccine was safe. Now, this was scandalous because the idea of a European woman showing her bare arm and getting a shot was unheard of, but it was incredibly effective. Um, the workers all agreed to get the shot and the family fortune was saved. Um, at this point, the, her brothers-in-law in London began to get nervous because it was clear that Flora Sassoon was very good at what she did and was showing a kind of initiative that they hadn't expected. And so essentially her brothers-in-law staged a boardroom coup that took control of the company uh, away from her 
and, and gave it just to the men in the family. Um, Flora ended up traveling to London where she became a very well-known philanthropist and, and Jewish scholar, but she never set foot uh, in the Sassoon businesses again. Um, she hit what a friend of mine said, she hit the bamboo ceiling. Um, she was just not able um, to go any further. Um, another remarkable woman is a woman named Laura Kaduri. Um, now, as I mentioned, the Sassoon business had expanded very rapidly in China. And one of the dilemmas they faced was who was going to staff all these offices? Who was going to work for them across China? And so what the Sassoons did was they sent word back to Baghdad uh, to say to other Jews, if you will send us your teenage boys, they were almost always boys, um, we will train them, we'll educate them, um, we will give them jobs because they trusted a workforce that was you know, other Jews who had come from Baghdad. Um, and the Sassoon set up essentially, which was a, a pipeline from Baghdad to India to China, where they built um, not only schools um, for their employees, but Jewish hospitals in case they got sick, um, Jewish cemeteries, so they had a place to be buried, Jewish synagogues so they could worship. And so as a result, um, hundreds, thousands of Jews moved from Baghdad into China, supported by the Sassoons. And one of them was a, a man named Eli Kaduri. Um, whose family had, you know, been sort of upper middle class. His father had died. His family had fallen on hard times in Baghdad. And so his mother sent him off um, uh, to Bombay to work for the Sassoons. He was 14 years old when he left Baghdad. And I sometimes imagine what it must have been like for him. Um, he apprenticed for the Sassoons. At 18, he was sent to a, a coastal town in China to work for the Sassoons trading business. He didn't speak a word of Chinese, um, but he was incredibly clever and quickly realized that he could make a lot of money on his own. He didn't have to work for the Sassoons. And so Eli Kaduri went down to Hong Kong. He began investing and trading and um, quickly became a millionaire. And as he turned 30, uh, it became time for him to find a wife. So he sailed to London and met uh, Laura Makata. Laura was the daughter of kind of the British Jewish aristocracy. Her family had uh, moved to, um, moved to uh, England um, a couple of hundred years earlier. Uh, they had become quite wealthy. Uh, Ellie met Laura, they fell in love, and they got married. Now, typically at that point, what would have happened was that Laura would have stayed in London um, and Ellie would have gone back to China um, to pursue his fortune and, you know, maybe come back twice a year. But Laura was a very unusual woman. She was older than Ellie, uh, very adventurous. And in fact, her family was very worried that she was going to die a spinster because she was too independent spirited. And she announced after the wedding that she wasn't going to stay in London, um, but was going to go with Ellie, go with her husband back to China. Um, and so they sailed together back to Hong Kong. And very quickly, Laura had two children. Um, and what's remarkable for me was that she decided that she was going to accompany um, her husband as he traveled throughout China building the business. And an even luckier break, um, she kept a diary of all those years um, as she traveled. And reading it, it's almost like reading you know, Catherine Hepburn and the African Queen. Here she is with these two children and this retinue of Chinese servants traveling across China while her husband, Ellie, is doing business deals. She's seeing the effects of civil war. She's seeing the starvation. She's seeing the terrible state of so many Chinese. And in many ways, I think she became the conscience of the Kaduri family. She decided after several years of this kind of traveling that the problem in China was that girls were not being educated. Now, this is back in like 1905. I mean, no one is really thinking this way. Um, but, but she was convinced that if girls were educated, that would begin to break the cycle of poverty and, and, and begin to help China kind of rebuild itself. And so she convinced her husband to fund these schools for Chinese girls. Chinese girls were not educated by anyone, by the Chinese or anyone else. Um, she also supported the creation of these schools back in Baghdad. Um, the Kaduris ended up moving to Shanghai, um, where they lived uh, in a grand house. 
And um, at one point around 1919, a fire broke out in the house and um, Laura Kaduri ran out, um, but was convinced that the governess she had hired, the Chinese governess to take care of her children was still trapped inside, trapped in the flames. So she ran back inside the house to rescue her. The smoke was everywhere. As it turned out, the Chinese uh, governess had run out a different door and Laura became disoriented by the smoke. She was uh, overcome and she died in the fire. Now, this was obviously a tragedy for the Kaduri family, but it was also a story the Chinese told over and over again, and even tell today. The idea that a wealthy British woman would run into a fire to save a Chinese servant was something that was almost unimaginable to most Chinese. And I think it reflected not only her commitment to kind of the, the, the real life of the Chinese, but also I think affected the way the Kaduris acted and the way her sons especially um, carried on the family name um, even, after, um, even, after she was, even after she was dead. Um, I just wanna jump now to the, the part of the story which if there's ever a movie made, um, Victor Sassoon will certainly be the star. Um, there were, as I say, the Sassoons were in England, they were, they were living it up, they were doing very well. And Victor Sassoon, um, was uh, a playboy, um, someone who everyone thought would spend all the money the Sassoons made, never earn any more. Um, he was born uh, in Europe. He went to Cambridge University. And even as a college student, would always be seen with a chorus girl on each arm. He had one of the best wine cellars uh, in England. Um, but during World War I, he, um, he was injured. Um, flying a plane during World War I and uh, became crippled. He lost the use of his legs. He had to get around on, on, uh, on crutches. And he fell into a depression because he believed that the great social life that he had you know, been looking forward to and that he was enjoying as this wealthy uh, playboy was just gonna be beyond reach. And so uh, he decided to go to India and China to see if he could make a go of it in terms of business. Um, and again, he turned out to be a very good uh, businessman, um, but he also knew how to enjoy his money. Um, it was Victor Sassoon who basically went to Shanghai and built the hotel called the Cafe Hotel, which I had stumbled into that first trip to China with the marble floors and the, the, the crystal chandelier. Um, and he turned that hotel uh, into a show place, not only for Shanghai, but for the world. And he really put Shanghai on the map. He built many other buildings, but his great gift was turning Shanghai into a place that everybody had to go to. You know, now we're all planning our post-pandemic trips. If this were 1928 or 1932, we'd all be planning trips to Shanghai. Um, Charlie Chaplin sailed to Shanghai um, to stay at the Cafe Hotel with Victor Sassoon. Noel Coward wrote Private Lives in a suite at the Cafe Hotel. Wallace Simpson, who would later go on to make the King of England leave his throne, was photographed new in Shanghai, uh, wearing only a life vest. I mean, that's what Shanghai was like. It was glamorous, but it was also a little bit naughty. It was exotic. Um, and Victor Sassoon really stood at the center of all of this. He would have these extraordinary parties where he would dress up as a circus master and all the guests had to dress up as circus acts. He would be the schoolmaster and everyone else had to dress up as pupils. It was just a riotous scene. Um, at one point when I was doing research for the book, um, I went to the hotel, which has been completely restored now. And they took me to Victor Sassoon's penthouse where he lived and out the windows kind of could see his whole Shanghai empire spread out before him. So I was walking around and, um, and I, I went into the bathroom, which was beautiful, and there were two bathtubs. And so I, I turned to the Chinese fellow uh, taking me around and I said, why are there two bathtubs? And he kind of blushed and he said, well, he said, Victor Sassoon always said he didn't mind sharing his bed, but he didn't like sharing his bath. So that's what it was like to be Victor Sassoon in, in, in Shanghai in the 1920s and 1930s. But what begins to happen in the late 1930s is that these cruise ships that have been coming with you know, celebrities, 
Charlie Chaplin and Wallace Simpson begin bringing other people to Shanghai. And these are Jewish refugees. Um, by the late 1930s, of course, Hitler had come to power. He had annexed Austria. And it was clear that the Nazis were um, going to be going to war and the Jews were already in peril, um, especially in Germany and in Austria. Um, and they were desperate to get out. But as we also know, every place in the world was shutting its door to these Jewish refugees who were trying to escape, including the United States and Britain, except for Shanghai. Because Shanghai was occupied in part by the British, it had been colonized in part by the Americans, by the French, the Japanese were moving in, there was really no functioning government. And what that meant was you didn't need a visa to get into Shanghai. If you showed up in Shanghai, you were safe. You, no one could kick you out. So as word of this spread throughout, uh, especially Vienna and Berlin, many middle-class Jews or upper-middle-class Jews sold their belongings to try to book passage on these cruise ships to take them and their families to Shanghai. They didn't really know anything about Shanghai, but it promised that it would be a place where they could be safe. And so um, month after month in the late 1930s, cruise ships kept showing up in Shanghai, depositing thousands of these Jewish refugees. And when you look at the pictures, I mean, these are you know, professors and store owners, lawyers, musicians, all dressed in their kind of Berlin or Vienna finery, like they're ready for a, you know, a walk down the street. And they're coming to a city that is you know, completely Chinese. They don't speak Chinese. No one in, no one in Shanghai um, is speaking English or German. Um, there's tremendous poverty. Chinese are literally dying in the streets. And this is their new home. And at, that, at this point, Victor Sassoon and Eli Kaduri, even though they're businessmen, really step up and they begin to uh, convert many of the properties they own, the hotels they own, into places where these refugees can stay. Um, Victor Sassoon employs many of them. Um, he, hires, um, he hires these refugees. The Kaduris actually set up a school for refugee children because families are arriving, but the children have no structure. And the only place where these refugees can afford to live are in these very poor neighborhoods where we saw the mezuzahs many decades later, but they have no structure to their lives. And so the Kaduris hire many of the refugees who are teachers and set up a school where the, the children uh, begin to go to school. And many of those children end up becoming very prominent. Michael Blumenthal, who's the become Secretary of the Treasury of the US, Mike Medavoy, who's a Hollywood executive, Lawrence Tribe, who is a professor at Harvard. These are all uh, refugees who fled with their families as children and were finding safety and even education in Shanghai. Victor Sassoon, though, does something else, which is that as all these refugees are showing up, um, the Japanese can't quite figure out what to do. At this point, the Japanese have essentially encircled Shanghai. They haven't taken over the city. It's before Pearl Harbor. They don't want the US to enter the war or turn the US into an enemy. So they essentially are kind of occupying parts of Shanghai. Um, but these Jews are arriving and the Nazis, who are Japan's ally at that point, are putting pressure on the Japanese to do something about their Jewish problem. And so the Japanese uh, name an anti-Semitic Japanese uh, captain uh, to be in charge of their Jewish problem. And he meets with Victor Sassoon, who is the most prominent and wealthiest Jew in Shanghai, to try to work out what to do, how to stop these refugees from coming in. Victor Sassoon was a charmer, and he proceeds to kind of do a con game on the Japanese, where he invites them into his hotel, he invites them into his nightclubs, and he begins to tell them, look, you know, you're welcome here. Um, I want you to enjoy my hospitality. At the same time, he's having his bartenders and waiters spy on the Japanese uh, so he can report back uh, to the British what's going on. Um, but he also convinces the Japanese that the Jews are kind of a useful bargaining chip. Victor Sassoon says, look, maybe I'll invest in some Japanese companies. Maybe I'll talk to my friend Churchill and keep the British you know, out of, out of the war. I'll talk to my friends in Hollywood and have them talk to Roosevelt. 
So as a result, the Japanese don't shut the doors to Shanghai. They keep on allowing thousands of Jews, uh, Jewish refugees um, to show up. At one point, Victor Sassoon secretly flies to South America to try to buy land where he thinks these Jews can be resettled. Um, it doesn't work out, but it shows the kind of commitment he was feeling, but also how he was trying to maneuver to, to kind of keep, uh, keep the gates open. I mean, it's a little bit like a Schindler's List in, in Shanghai. Um, but eventually, the, the Japanese realize what's going on. Victor Sassoon has to flee the country. He flees to India just before Pearl Harbor. And at that point, the Japanese completely occupy Shanghai. And then the Nazis uh, send members of the Gestapo <clears throat> to meet with the Japanese. And they say to them, one of them is a veteran of the destruction of the, of the, uh, of the creation of the, the ghetto in Warsaw. And they meet with the Japanese and the Nazis say, look, you have 18,000 Jews now in Shanghai. This is, you know, you, you can't, we, we can't allow this. What we propose is that on Rosh Hashanah, which is coming up, all these Jews, many of them will be in their synagogues. You can gather them all up there, um, put them on uh, boats and ships, uh, tugboats in the middle of the river, sink the boats, and then you will have solved your Jewish problem. The Japanese are appalled by this, in part because they still believe what Victor Sassoon has told them, that it, it's better to kind of keep these Jews maybe as a bargaining chip. Um, and as a result, um, they don't kill the Jews. And in fact, 18,000 Jews are saved and no Jews are killed um, by the Japanese um, during all the years that they're in Shanghai uh, until they're liberated in 1945. And when the Americans finally liberate Shanghai, they're told that they're gonna be liberating a ghetto because the Japanese had moved all the Jews into this neighborhood where I saw the mezuzahs. And many of the American soldiers liberated the concentration camps already. They had seen what had happened at the Warsaw Ghetto. But they show up at this ghetto in Shanghai and they discover that there are synagogues there. And yes, conditions are, are bad, but all the Jews have survived. Unfortunately, the Jews had actually been cut off from really any news about what was happening in Europe. And so they had planned to go back to their homes in Vienna, Berlin, and elsewhere. And there are these haunting pictures that you see where the Americans start putting up large posters listing all the towns in Germany, Austria, Poland, where all the Jews have been wiped out. Um, and in the cities, what has happened to all the Jews. And these refugees sort of realize the enormity of what happened, how while they you know, had suffered with poor housing and poor food, they had at least survived. And so, uh, these Jewish refugees who had planned to return to Europe, return to their lives, instead end up going to the United States, to Palestine, to Australia. Um, Victor Sassoon comes back, the Kaduris come back. They figure that the parties will continue, they'll, begin, they'll continue to make more money. Um, but of course, as we know, that's not what happens. The communists have been growing in power. Um, after the war, they uh, declare civil war against the nationalists. And within a few years, they have surrounded Shanghai and they've conquered it. Victor Sassoon flies out of Shanghai. Um, he has a return ticket, but he never goes back. And in fact, he's lost most of his fortune to the communists because most of his money was in real estate. The hotel that I saw, uh, beer factories, all these buildings he had built. Um, and he ends up settling in the Bahamas and becomes quite bitter about China. At one point he says, he sounds like a spurned lover. He says, I didn't leave China, China left me. And he never, he never returns. The Kaduris in many ways are smarter. Um, uh, Eli Kaduri had not gotten out of China in time. And so the entire Kaduri family, Eli Kaduri the patriarch um, and his two sons were imprisoned. Um, in a Japanese internment camp. And Eli Kaduri developed cancer, he was not given any treatment, and he died during the war under J in Japanese custody. Um, his two sons though survived, they're in their 40s, and they then take over the family business and they move everything to Hong Kong because they're convinced that at some point, China will open up again and the communists will have to deal with them. Well, the Kaduris end up uh, becoming really 
incredibly important in rebuilding Hong Kong and turning it into the kind of economic miracle um, that we see today. Um, they are now, the Kuduris are now the richest Western family in China. They're worth more than $13 billion. Um, they consult regularly with the Chinese leadership, with Xi Jinping um, and others. But at this moment, they're also incredibly nervous as everyone is in Hong Kong, trying to understand as China tightens up, as China becomes more repressive, as it moves into Hong Kong very aggressively, is this Shanghai all over again? And will they once again um, have to flee? So I'll, I'll stop the story there um, and uh, I can talk more about what's going on now in questions. But I think that gives you a sense of kind of these extraordinary families um, and their journey, um, but also some of the questions it raises about, you know, the decisions they made, the moral choices they face. And in some cases they acted nobly and in some cases not so nobly. Um, and I think that's an interesting kind of point to reflect on. But Chuck, I'll turn it over to you for questions. Um, first of all, I mean, it's kind of hard to... Uh, thank Do you want the microphone? Okay. Um, thank you. I mean, your presentation is so comprehensive. I don't even know where to start. It's like you covered just about everything, all the questions I had. But um, thank you for coming. And also, I mean, it's, um, I think we were all grateful to be here and after the pandemic. And I'm very proud of our synagogue for having this event and, and for moving into um, a more normal situation. Thank you, Gordon Bennett, our president, and, and Rabbi Hamilton, and, and uh, Jerry Lecker, of course. Thank you. And uh, it's just great to be doing it. And um, I guess that, I mean, I've, I'm kind of like a, an amateur armchair historian of Jewish history. And like probably most Americans, I've always focused on the history of Judaism from the time of antiquity up to the Roman times. And then I go into Europe from Roman times to the Holocaust and then to Israel and America, but I never really thought much about, nor did I study the history of Jews in Asia. And your families, the Kaduris and the Sassoons, they come out of that culture, they come out of Baghdad. So I'm wondering if you could just elaborate a bit on what life was like for Jews in Baghdad and how was it in a way different, maybe philosophically, maybe literally from European, the European Jewry that we all come from? No, it's a great question. I, I think that, you know, when you talk to Iraqi Jews, <clears throat> they consider themselves Sephardi Jews, but Iraqi Jews, they consider themselves the aristocracy of the Jewish people. They say we're better businessmen, we're better scholars. I mean, they just see themselves at the very top. And I think part of the reason for that is because they kind of started there. In other words, starting with the destruction of the temple when these Jews are kidnapped, you know, immediately they're um, doing very well in trade and economics and have this influence. So the, the climb from, you know, the ghetto or the shtetl, you know, in a way they bypass, they bypass that. In fact, there's a funny thing that Sassoon's have done family histories. And in one of them, they say, well, everybody knows about the Rothschilds, but when the Rothschilds were still, didn't have, you know, two, coins to rub together, we were already, you know, one of the wealthiest families in the world. So I think that's part of it. What is interesting, I think, and one reason I was drawn to these families, is that they quickly become in many ways like us. And I say that in the sense that um, they were very religious coming out of Baghdad. And when you, um, when they moved to England, though, all those pressures of assimilation, you know, bear down on them. And I was able to go through a lot of the wills that the Sassoons filed in London. And you can almost hear the patriarch thundering in these wills, you know, you must marry someone Jewish, you must marry someone from Baghdad. But of course they don't, many of them intermarry. Um, they become really, in most cases, conservative or reform Jews. And to me, what becomes interesting is that in many ways they resemble, you know, Michael Bloomberg or, you know, Jews who we know um, the Kraft family, you know, who are kind of prominent and would be interesting to write about on their own, but they also have this kind of Jewish 
background. And so you get to see how being Jewish affects both their rise, but also their decisions and, and how they do business and so forth. So I, I think in a way, a, it's a very modern experience. Um, you know, we tend to think of Jewish history as writing about scholars and, and artists and so forth, and obviously about the Holocaust, but writing about kind of Jews in the world who have this kind of political and economic role um, is something that I think is kind of new. And for me was fascinating because, you know, I mean, the Sassoons were a grand family, but if the Kaduri showed up here, they could be in the book club. I mean, they, they, they really have a sensibility, which I think is very, is very modern. And I think the Sassoons also were always caught with this sense of, are we British? Are we Jewish? You know, we're knighted, we're lords, but does that mean we're really accepted? And that's kind of a very modern dilemma, I think, as well. Now, um, Rabbi David Starr, during his High Holiday Sermon, he talked about the need for the Jewish people to, in a way, not to find ourselves by externals like, like uh, anti-Semitism and, and all of these very important things, and to look within spiritually at our own house and who we are and how we um, see and ourselves as individuals who we are. And that might include unpleasant things, and we should do that without fear uh, of um, handing weapons in a way to our enemies. So we, 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 you do a good and unvarnished job of looking at some of the darker side of these families um, and, and do so forthrightly, in particular, the fact that, of lack of a better term, they started out as drug traffickers. They were drug dealers. And um, how did they square that with their Jewish values? And um, how conscious were they of that? And what, I mean, did you find in your, I know you looked at the original papers, did they talk about that at all? No, it's, it's a fascinating question. And I think in the end, they were creatures of their time. Their views of the Chinese <clears throat> really were no different than any kind of wealthy British family doing business with China saw the Chinese, they were colonialists, they were imperialists. The Chinese were not fully, I don't want to say fully human, but they just didn't sort of see them. And, and in that they were no different than others. It is interesting that once they, well, one advantage, for example, that the, the Sassoons had was that they were willing to deal with the Chinese and empower Chinese traders to distribute the opium. So in a, in a strange way, yes, they were dealing in opium, but they made a lot of Chinese incredibly rich um, because they had this insight that we're not gonna sell the opium to people. We'll hire Chinese to do it and give them a stake and they became richer. So there is this kind of tension where when you talk to the Chinese, they recognize that a lot of the kind of, especially in a place like Shanghai, the business sense that the Chinese have that we've all seen dramatically in recent decades, a lot of that they were first exposed to because of these families, whether it was opium or later kind of the global business that they were doing. By and large, I think the Sassoons and the Kaduris treated their workers a little better than others did, but they also, and frankly, one of the things that's interesting is that the Kaduri sons, Lawrence and Horace, um, uh, their father dies in captivity, as I say. Lawrence and Horace then moved to Hong Kong. And one of the things they decide was that their father had been living in a bubble. He was living in this huge mansion, 43 rooms in the middle of Shanghai, and never realized that the communists were starting a revolution literally a mile or two away. And that was why they had lost almost everything when Shanghai fell to the communists. And so the, the sons decided they were not going to be they were not gonna make that mistake. And one of the things they ended up doing was in addition to pursuing their business interests, becoming immensely wealthy, they owned the Peninsula Hotel chain and all sorts of things. They actually ended up helping 300,000 Chinese refugees who were fleeing the communists and moving into Hong Kong. And what they started to do was to create almost a micro loan program where these farmers could come in borrow some money, set up a small farm, and um, begin to kind of get themselves um, into the economy. And they also funded a huge amount of research on pigs. Pork, as we know, is a staple of the Chinese diet. 
and Hong Kong's population was exploding. And so the Kaduris funded all this research to create bigger pigs and fatter pigs that Chinese refugees could, you know, could grow and, and make money. And so the joke, when I was researching this, you speak to Chinese in Hong Kong and they say, oh, the Kaduris, they know everything about pigs except what they taste like because they were keeping kosher and they would. So I think the Chinese had an awareness that yes, these were imperialists, yes, they were treating us badly, but they were different. And one of the things that's striking to me is that China is one of the few places you can go these days, and I know Gordon, you and others have had the experience of getting to know Chinese. The Chinese are fascinated by the Jews. You know, they're re you don't see that kind of anti-Semitism that you get even in places like Japan. Um, the Chinese are, are fascinated, and there's a, a way in which, I think part of it is the legacy of these families, they identify more with Jews, with our, you know, with family structure, with the fact that Jews value education. Um, there is a connection there, which you don't see in a lot of other countries. You know, I think that in spite of the um, admittedly shady origins of their success, they went legit and they did bring kind of a higher Jewish values and ethics to their business dealings, to the way they treated employees and to the way they treated each other that I think is something that you mentioned in the book. And I, when I think about Jewish businesses, I mean, not that anyone's perfect, but you know, it does have that level to it. And uh, I was interested in the family dynamic because that same family dynamic seemed to have been the case with a lot of very successful Jewish families. I would particularly mention the Rothschilds in that the, the, the sons would be sent out to each do like a certain function and they maintained very close contact with each other. And they had like a close loyal circle that would extend to other Jews and other Jewish families and where they would build an out sort of a concentric network that would eventually reach many countries. Is that a trend do you think in uh, that emanates from Jewish understanding and Jewish uh, faith? Yeah, no, I, I, I think it does. I mean, <clears throat> I wouldn't use this as advice on how to raise your family and how to treat it, but I guess two things were striking to me. One was that the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, that the, um, the Sassoon's, the father, exerted very loose control in the sense that he sent the eight sons out there and he allowed them to build up their own stakes and he sort of guided with a, a kind of a gentle hand. As a result, the minute he died, all of a sudden started feuding with each other and the family actually split um, and kind of went in two different directions. The Kaduris, by contrast, once their mother died, uh, Eli Kaduri ruled with an iron hand. He made his two sons, uh, when they went to London, come back to work for him. Uh, Lawrence Kaduri in his 50s would say, I never had much of a childhood um, because his father was very controlling. Um, and that family is still together. The Sassoon fortune was dissipated. I mean, they're not poor, but they, you know, the, the family was scattered. Um, the Kaduris have, you know, remained very close under the kind of shadow of, of, uh, of their father. So, um, you know, I'm not sure. I mean, I think where the, the Jewish aspect comes tr through, which was really touching for me, is that the two brothers, Lawrence and Horace Kaduri, who kind of run the business in Shanghai, survive the war and then go to Hong Kong. One was in Hong Kong, one was in Shanghai in the 30s and 40s. And they ended up writing to each other just about every day. Um, it was almost like Facebook. They would, they would write and then they would ship it off and then the answer would come back scribbled on the same piece of paper so you can really see the, the thing. And what was so interesting was the, they always sign off by saying, my brother, I wish you love. You know, um, they, they, even when they're arguing over things, there is this sense of family, Blood is thicker than anything. And I, I do think there's an aspect of that, which, you know, obviously we try to instill in our own families and, and in our children um, that was very strong. And I think that's something the Chinese responded to. Um, whenever I would speak to the Chinese, they would say, yes, the Jewish people, they, you know, they, they respect their elders, they have a tight family, and that's why they've survived for so long. Right. And you also mentioned the, the, the value of education and the right. cutting edge of science and knowledge. Right, right. The These are all, and I think, you know, it's interesting, Eli Kaduri, at one point, um, when the Balfour Declaration comes out, 
Elikadori is a Zionist, and he basically meets with Sun Yat-sen, who is sort of the George Washington of China, and says, will you endorse the Balfour Declaration? And Sun Yat-sen writes this extraordinary letter where he says, you know, your people have been without a homeland. We Chinese are being colonized by the West. We've lost our homeland. We hope that just as, as you want a homeland again, we can regain our homeland. So even at that political level, there seems to have been some connection that was established. I want to bring up one more issue and then open it up for questions. And um, it was fascinating the, the how Victor Sassoon manipulated Japanese anti-Semitism at the beginning of the war. And you mentioned the fact that uh, American financier Jacob Schiff had been involved in financing Japan during the Russo-Japanese War in 1905, and did so because he wanted to, because he was angry at the Tsar. The Tsar responded after losing that war by, by um, commissioning the writing of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. And then of course you ended up with the Bolshevik Revolution. Um, but the Japanese kind of saw the Jews in that light, that they were controllers of the world, which of course is an anti-Semitic trope. But nevertheless, Victor Sassoon seemed to have manipulated that in his favor by saying, right. hey, you know, we know everybody, we control right. everybody, so you better right. Right. Not, not damage us. Right. It, it was a different, it was a different, you know, the, the, if you look at anti-Semitism, the Nazi anti-Semitism was the Jews are dangerous, they control the world, therefore we have to exterminate them. Um, the Japanese version of anti-Semitism, which I think Victor Sassoon understood and used, was that the Jews control the world and the economy, but if they're on our side, that can be a good thing. And so he was able to kind of play to that um, until the Japanese in Tokyo realized what was going on. But, but he had a very astute sense of, you know, the language you use with the Japanese was different than you might use with the Nazis. Right, right. You knew who we were talking to. So, um, by all means, if you would like to chime in with the question. Sure. Um, the question is, is the book being translated into Chinese and will it get Chinese readers? Um, the answer, amazingly, is yes. Um, I was sort of I just assumed that given what's going on with US-China relations, that wouldn't happen. So I got a call from my agent at one point and he said, I have good news and bad news. The good news is the Chinese want to translate and publish your book. The bad news is they have a few suggestions. <laughs> and so, um, but it was interesting because the Chinese went through it, the English version, and the only parts they changed, they didn't want to change the history. They, in the introduction, I talk about, you know, the Tiananmen massacre. And that literally had a red line through it. And it has to read the events of June 4th, which is how the Chinese do it. I talked about uh, the great leap forward when Mao killed millions of people. That had a line kind of drawn through it. And then, it, right. And then at the next, um, and then at the end of the book, I talk about Shanghai being a more sophisticated cosmopolitan city because of the influence of these families. And I say, unlike, Beijing, which is nationalistic and repressive. And nationalistic and repressive got crossed out. But that was really about it. And, and what I think is interesting is that it shows a willingness on the part of certainly intellectuals in China to kind of understand this history. But I was doing a talk, a Zoom talk to Los Angeles. And, and one, of the, one of the men who was uh, on the Zoom is a businessman in China. He had recently been in China. And um, he had his translator in a taxi, and he said to the taxi driver, he wanted to see the old Jewish ghetto where the Jewish refugees had been. And the taxi driver said to him, oh, the Jews, yeah, he said, we Chinese are good people. We helped save the Jews in World War II. So, you know, there is that kind of folk wisdom, I, I guess, as well. Um, so yeah, the book will be published. But of course, this being geopolitics, Taiwan is also publishing it. They're publishing their own version, and then the mainland is publishing its version. So I take some heart in that. Yes. Yeah. 
you know, I, I'd like to say that's true, but the story is actually even more interesting. Um, among the refugees who were in the ghetto, um, a lot of some of them went to Israel. In 1978, uh, China fights a war against Vietnam, which the Chinese are kind of humiliated. The Vietnamese are able to beat them back, and, and it's sort of a humiliation. The US and China are kind of establishing diplomatic relations, and the Chinese foreign minister meets with Henry Kissinger and says, can we buy some of your anti-tank weapons? Because the Vietnamese are using Russian tanks, and we don't know how to combat them, but you Americans do. So can we buy your, you know, your anti-tank weapons? Henry Kissinger says, look, you know, we can't do that. You're, you know, we're still, you know, we're not that friendly. But Kissinger says, you know who also has a good record uh, defeating Russian tanks in the Yom Kippur War is Israel. And it turns out that uh, among the refugees, uh, the children of refugees that were in the in Shanghai during the war um, is Shaul Eisenberg, who ends up becoming a major Israeli industrialist and arms dealer. And so the Chinese reach out to him and he ends up over the next 20 years, I don't think relations are normalized with Israel to the 1998 or 1999, for the next 20 years, a series of unmarked planes fly between Ben Gurion Airport and Beijing, delivering all sorts of military supplies. And today, you know, Benjamin Netanyahu goes to Shanghai, he, you know, visits the site of, of um, uh, where the Jewish refugees live. Relations between China and Israel are very close. Um, and so part of it, as I said, is we like the Jews and all this stuff. The other part is that was a very important uh, arms relationship, which again had its roots in the fact that, that you know, he had been saved and had this connection to China which the Chinese recognized and were able to use. Mm -hmm. yeah. Everyone should be so lucky. Hmm. Okay, so the question was, one was a comment that the Peninsula Hotel serves this great, you know, high tea. And again, this is sort of a very Jewish thing. If you go to the Peninsula Hotel, you do feel like you're in Downton Abbey, and you do feel like you're, you know, being treated like British royalty. And you have to remind yourself, this hotel was built by a Jewish immigrant from Baghdad you know, who, who spoke broken English. I mean, this ability of Jews in whatever society they're in to kind of figure out, you know, how to succeed is kind of remarkable um, when you think about it. Then the other question was, will this, you know, the talk about opium and so forth be used somehow um, to foment anti-Semitism or, 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 or things like that? I mean, look, the Sackler issue is out there. Obviously, I think there's been a lot of introspection about what the Sacklers uh, did and how much of that was there, you know, was just being doing business or being criminals. Um, I mean, I, I don't think, I mean, yes, the white supremacists will find anything and use that to attack Jews. Um, right, yeah, I don't, I don't see the whole critical race theory debate um, appropriating this. My own feeling about critical race theory and about these issues is that, you know, as Jews, if we can talk honestly about our, our failings as well as our successes and try to put them in some sort of context, in the end, I believe people will, you know, uh, understand that. Not everyone. Um, obviously, there's always going to be people who are going to, you know, on the left and the right who are going to use 
um, use things against Jews. But my feeling is, is that, as you say, no group is perfect. And if we acknowledge it and then talk about what the lessons are, certainly internally as Jews, I think it's a valuable conversation. That's right. We can worry about our own house. Right, right. Any other questions? Yeah. Please. I'm sorry, can you speak up? Yeah. Um, so the question is, did I sort of follow the Sassoons and the Kaduris to today? And how much does their kind of the way they grew up and, and the, the, the lineage of the families play out? Um, it's still very strong, but it's played out in different ways. Um, the Sassoons essentially were seduced by Britain. And um, they, if you go to, the Sassoons are very well known in Britain. Um, and they moved pretty rapidly uh, into the arts. They became government ministers. They became great art collectors. Um, the, uh, we were just talking before, the MFA has acquired the Sassoon Torah covers. They were great collectors of Judaica. So the Sassoons really um, became assimilated into British society and are quite prominent today, um, not in business, but in government and culture. Um, and so forth. Siegfried Sassoon was a famous poet of, of World War I. Um, the Kaduris kind of kept their focus on business and really, you know, were political, but in a much quieter way, but also in some ways were never really accepted by the British. And I think that's one reason why they became, they were more Zionist, um, is because they always felt, I mean, they clearly had the ability to live anywhere, and yet they've stayed in Hong Kong. Um, they're British citizens, but they've made that their home. And I, I think that reflects kind of a, you know, a, a, a way in which, um, you know, their, their views of their outsider status are still, are still pretty strong. It is interesting, the book came out and it has gotten a fair amount of attention. I've gotten calls from members of the Sassoon family who say, we never knew a lot of this, you know? I mean, the, and also, I mean, the history you get at the kitchen table is not often what the real history uh, was. With the Kaduris, it's interesting. I did share the manuscript um, with both families before we published it. Typically, as a journalist, you don't show people what you're going to write. But I was writing, essentially, a dual biography. And as my agent said, you don't want to get into a legal fight with a family worth $13 billion. It's just not a good way to go. So I, I, wrote, I wrote to both families with the manuscript, and I said, you know, I'd like any corrections, but understand that the historical interpretation is mine. And the Sassoons, who were a more worldly family in some ways, were very generous. Lord Sassoon, who's the head of the family now, you know, gave me some more information. And then he said, as you say, historical interpretations may differ, but I wish you the best of luck. The Kaduris were quite, they became concerned about a number of things. And it turned out the things, the two things they were most upset about were um, I had characterized uh, Lawrence Kaduri, who is the father of the current head of the family, Michael Kaduri's father, Lawrence. I called him Squat, which he was. And his son was just furious. He said, he's big boned. He's, you know, and so I, I decided to just kind of describe him rather than do that. And then um, they, uh, they, they had several mansions. One of them was in Hong Kong and um, on the water. And Michael Kaduri kept on writing to me saying, it's not a mansion, it's a bungalow, it's a bungalow. And I realized at a certain point, he was thinking of like, um, you know, in Rhode Island, the bungalows in, in Newport, that's what he was thinking about. So I just described that it was, you know, 16 rooms and looked like a hotel and, and all that kind of thing. So it's just kind of interesting to me that when you write about people, yeah, we don't care about the opium trade and all that. You know, don't call my grandfather fat. You know, it's just kind of interesting what triggers people. Yes. So there are questions from Zoom. Um, 
and I guess we'll share them. There was one interesting one um, from M. Yao, so stating that there were uh, different Chinese aristocratic families, very wealthy in Shanghai, and did the Sassoons and the Kadori families trade or interact with them and potentially intermarry with them? With Chinese um, families. With some of these aristocrat aristocratic right. Chinese families. Thank so um, so it's interesting. When I, was, um, when I was doing the research for the book, um, Victor Sassoon never married in Shanghai. Um, he ended up moving to the Bahamas, and he ended up marrying his nurse, who was from uh, Dallas, Texas. And so when Victor Sassoon died, his papers ended up going to Southern Methodist University Library in Dallas, Texas, of all places. So I went down there to look through them. And they were all his kind of business diaries where he said, you know, had dinner with this businessman, that businessman, Chiang Kai-shek, whatever it happened to be. So I'm going through these business diaries, and these pictures of nude women start dropping out. And I'm sort of embarrassed, and I'm convinced the librarian is going to walk by and like throw me out for having these pictures of, of nude women. The way Victor Sassoon met women, it turned out, he was an amateur photographer. He would go down as these ships were pulling in um, before the refugees were arriving in the early 30s. And when beautiful women would come off the ships, he would offer to photograph them in his studio. And then he would have affairs with them or whatever. But those pictures gave me great insight, not only into what it was like to be Victor Sassoon with all these photographs of naked women, a number of the women were Chinese or Indian. And so it turns out Victor Sassoon was actually, and the Kaduris both were breaking the social convention that said you could not have social relations with, um, uh, with uh, Asians, essentially. So there was never any talk of marriage. These were, you know, affairs or kind of social things. Um, Victor Sassoon did have a serious relationship with a Jewish woman, Emily Hahn, who was a writer for The New Yorker. And um, she was kind of one-upping Victor Sassoon. At the same time she was having an affair with him, she was having an affair with a Chinese poet uh, who was a left-wing poet. And she and Victor would have lunches in his penthouse and she would say to him, Victor, you know, these communists are serious. I mean, they're really organizing. They're gonna conquer the country. And Victor would just kind of dismiss it and, and, not, and not listen. Um, but, um, but both families did break a lot of the social barriers, but there was no it, talk of intermarriage at that level. I mean, they were kind of the aristocracy of Shanghai. And so affairs were one thing, but marriage would never, would never happen. Yeah, there's some of them have been answered already, but uh, Miriam writes, any Zionists and the Kaduris or the Sassoon families? Yes, the, this, the, um, the Kaduris were Zionists. As I say, Eli Kaduri um, lobbied for the Balfour Declaration. Um, and again, I think part of that was because, you know, the Sassoons very quickly became British citizens and they were knighted and, and they became members of governments and palled around with the Prince of Wales and so forth. Eli Kaduri tried over and over again to become a British citizen, and he kept on being turned down. Um, and in fact, at one point I found a, a cable from the British Foreign Office from Hong Kong to London saying, if we give, we don't want to give Kaduri citizenship because then we'll have to give it to all of them, you know, these other Jewish immigrants. And so I think that that always kind of stung. Eventually Kaduri realized the way you got a knighthood was by giving money to the king's favorite charities, and, and then he was knighted. Um, but the, the Kaduris were always aware of being outsiders. And then when you saw um, the private correspondence of their business rivals, um, they were always making fun of their being Jewish and, and not wanting to be with them. And that's true really even today um, when there was the handover was being negotiated. Um, the British Foreign Office would use the Kaduris, but kind of um, kept a distance from them. And I think the Chinese recognized that. And that's one reason why the Chinese, when they opened up in the 70s, one of the first calls they made was to the Kaduri family, because they knew this was a way to bring in British money without having to deal with the British, that the Kaduris would be maybe more sympathetic, because they were kind of outsiders in the British establishment. I feel like we could go on and on, but 
the hour is late. It's just been wonderful. Thank you to everybody who came, everybody who joined us online. A big thanks to Gordon Bennett, our KI president, who never says no. Want it, Gordon, should we bring this? Should we have a Shabbat dinner? Gordon always is an enthusiastic yes. Um, thank you to Chuck Morris for being such an intelligent and insightful moderator to Barnett Kessel, who our executive director, who helped put together the evening, and to Robbie Schinder, our tech expert extraordinaire, and to Ira, our facilities manager, who came in when there was no Wi-Fi at 6.30. So um, again, thank you to Sarah for suggesting the book. KI Reads November 9th, The, La the Lost Shtetl by Max Gross. So please join us. And again, thank you. It's an thank honor you. to have you, Professor Kaufman. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Thank you very much.